This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Click the link in the description to take advantage of a special offer for Arvind Ash viewers. When Stephen Hawking first proposed his theory of black holes emitting radiation in 1975, it was a monumental breakthrough. Hawking radiation, as it came to be known, suggested that black holes are not completely black. In fact, they emit faint radiation consisting of photons and potentially neutrinos and other particles. But what if I told you that even Hawking's own book didn't accurately describe what's really going on? There's one crucial aspect of this theory that has become a bit too simplified in popular descriptions, specifically the idea that Hawking radiation comes from the spontaneous creation of virtual particle-antiparticle pairs near the event horizon of a black hole. While this explanation is catchy and relatively easy to visualize, it turns out to be wrong, or at least an egregious oversimplification of the actual quantum processes. To understand the reality, we need to dig a little deeper into the physics of Hawking radiation and see what's really going on and why. We're going to find the real explanation for Hawking radiation, what the mechanism is and why it happens. That's coming up right now. The basic idea of virtual particles comes from quantum field theory, which tells us that empty space, which is space with no particles or radiation, is not actually empty. Instead, it's teeming with a sea of virtual particles. These are fluctuations in the field where particles and antiparticles spontaneously appear and disappear, annihilating each other constantly. This happens everywhere in space-time. It's happening right now in front of you but you can't see it because these are virtual particles that appear and disappear so quickly that they're not measurable directly. We can only measure their effects. Near the event horizon of a black hole, this quantum fluctuation is no different. It happens there too. And this is what Hawking used to explain Hawking radiation in his popular 1988 book, A Brief History of Time. He explained it like this. When a pair of virtual particles forms at the very edge of the event horizon of a black hole, before they can annihilate each other, one of them falls into the black hole while the other escapes. The one that falls into the black hole carries negative energy, decreasing the mass of the black hole a tiny amount. The one that escapes carries away positive energy. And that's the Hawking radiation that we observe. Over a long period of time, this will cause the black hole to evaporate since they're constantly losing energy or mass. This picture is relatively simple and intuitive, and I think that's why Hawking used it to explain his theory to the masses. And it has become the way most people, including students and some physicists, understand it. But this picture is deeply flawed, and Hawking knew this to be the case because this popular explanation is not what he wrote in his 1974 paper on this phenomenon. But what is bizarre to me is that the actual explanation written in his paper, in my opinion, is not really much more complex. So I'll explain that as simply as I can here. What is true is that there really are quantum fields and they do have energy fluctuations. One way to express these fluctuations mathematically is creation of virtual particle-antiparticle pairs that come into existence and almost immediately annihilate each other. These particles are not measurable because they are virtual and they don't interact with real particles, which would be necessary to measure them. But these virtual particles in empty space, even when there's no real particles or radiation present, do create a kind of energy of empty space. This is called the zero point energy. Let's look at what causes these virtual particles. We can understand it by looking at the Heisenberg uncertainty principle formulated by Werner Heisenberg in 1927. One way to express this principle is in terms of energy and time, like this. This says that the uncertainty in energy, delta E, times the uncertainty in time, delta T, has to be greater than or equal to a constant, which is the Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. All measurable real particles obey this uncertainty. But what this also means is that unmeasurable virtual particles can exist below this inequality. In other words, particles with a low enough energy that exist for a small enough time can exist as long as the product of the uncertainties is less than h over 4 pi. And this is the region where these virtual particles exist. How do we know they exist if we can't measure them? We can measure them indirectly in experiments 
such as the Casimir effect, where the virtual fluctuations inside two plates can accommodate only certain wavelengths compared to the outside of the two plates. And this causes a pressure which attracts the two plates together. Here's how this equation helps us understand what's going on near a black hole. To any observer located anywhere in the universe, the zero point energy will appear to have the same value no matter where they're located. But relativity tells us that different observers perceive different realities. For example, clocks will tick more slowly for an observer that's moving versus one that's standing still. Similarly, the clock of an observer in a gravitational well due to the curvature of space-time will tick more slowly compared to an observer standing far away in flat space-time. Now let's look at this uncertainty equation in the context of an observer standing near the highly curved gravity well near a black hole's event horizon versus an observer standing infinitely far away in flat space-time. The flow of time will be different for them. This equation works the same for everyone regardless of whether they are in a severe gravity well versus very far from the black hole. To the local observer near the black hole, he will not be able to detect any particles because they will all be virtual to him. But for someone observing the black hole from far away, he will see something quite different coming from the same location. He will detect real particles. How is this possible? This has to do with relativity. The ticking of time is different. Since the time ticks more slowly for the person in the gravity well relative to the person far away, the delta t term in the uncertainty equation will be different. The uncertainty in time times the uncertainty of energy will be such that those virtual particles in the well will no longer be virtual, but real particles, as perceived by someone standing far away. To the person standing far away, these particles will obey the uncertainty equation because the product of the uncertainties will be greater than or equal to h over 4 pi from the perspective of far away. But for someone locally, those same particles will be under the uncertainty equation, so they will perceive those same particles to be virtual. The key insight is that near a black hole, what one observer describes as a vacuum state could look like a thermal bath of particles to another observer far from the black hole. This discrepancy arises because space-time curvature near the event horizon causes the particle-antiparticle pairs that would normally annihilate to appear as real particles, some of which can escape into space. And those particles that escape into space, that's Hawking radiation. This all has to do with the fact that the microscopic level quantum fields exist. The quantum fields in empty space obey Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which means there's a limit to the certainty with which we can know their energy or the time at which a specific energy can be assigned to them. Since a gravitational field bends space-time and affects the local passage of time, this means that observers in regions of space-time with different gravitational curvatures cannot agree on the energy of the quantum fields. So the bottom line is that the observer far from the black hole, who is unaffected by the extreme curvature of space-time near the event horizon, will interpret the quantum field as being filled with real particles, which we observe as Hawking radiation. And this is what Hawking also described in his original paper. Another point is that the radiation emitted by the black hole is not just any radiation, it is a thermal radiation, which is described by temperature. This temperature is inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole, meaning that smaller black holes emit more radiation and cool down faster than larger ones. This result is remarkable because it establishes a direct connection between the thermodynamics of black holes and the quantum behavior of fields in curved spacetime. As the black hole emits Hawking radiation, it loses energy or mass over time. The process is slow at first, but as the black hole shrinks, the radiation increases, accelerating the black hole's evaporation. Eventually, this leads to a black hole's complete destruction and a final burst of radiation, which for large black holes can last trillions of years. So we won't see a stellar mass black hole evaporating anytime soon. On the other hand, tiny primordial black holes that could have formed during the early universe might already have evaporated, though no one has observed this. So I want to point out the simplified picture that Hawking presented in his book has led to some common misconceptions. For example, 
His description made people believe that the radiation is created at the event horizon. In reality, it is mostly created pretty far away, around 10 to 20 times the radius of the black hole. This makes sense when we stop thinking about Hawking radiation happening due to the event horizon, but rather due to the extreme curvature near the black hole itself. Another surprising conclusion that comes from understanding the real description is that Hawking radiation doesn't just come from black holes, but from any collapsed star that curves spacetime, like white dwarfs and neutron stars. They would also radiate tiny amounts of Hawking radiation. But whether it's a black hole or other collapsed star, Hawking radiation is so faint that we currently don't have sensitive enough instruments to detect it. The temperature due to Hawking radiation is in fact lower than the background radiation of the cosmic microwave background, which is the leftover energy from the Big Bang. So detecting Hawking radiation is like trying to detect the light of a firefly in front of a searchlight. What's remarkable about Hawking's extraordinary accomplishments is that he had to conceptualize and solve all the problems mostly in his head, since it was difficult for him to put things on paper due to his disability. This takes a deep understanding of basic scientific principles and extraordinary problem-solving skills. If you wanna hone those same skills for yourself, try Brilliant.org, our sponsor today. I think they're one of the best online learning platforms available. One great course I found very useful and would recommend for you is called Scientific Thinking. It's a 39 lesson course where you'll learn the art of thinking scientifically. This may sound basic, but trust me when I say it will build the foundation to help you make sense of the universe, from the mechanics of machines to the physics of black holes. And you'll do this in bite-sized mini lessons with visual and interactive problem solving that gets you hands-on with key concepts. Brilliant helps you get smarter every day with thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Brilliant lessons are so impactful because they make the learning process fun by making each concept digestible, by using helpful interactive charts and graphics for clarity. You become highly engaged, so you end up remembering what you've learned long-term. Brilliant has a special offer for Arvind Ash viewers right now. Go to brilliant.org slash Arvind Ash to get started for absolutely free for the next 30 days. And if you decide to subscribe, you'll get 20% off the premium package. You've got nothing to lose, and I think you're gonna like it a lot. Just click the link in the description below. And if you learned something, give us a thumbs up and share this video. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.